name of the message today is redeemed. Jeanette George tells a story about an experience she had on a short tri uh, flight from Tucson to Phoenix. Across the aisle from her sat a young woman and her baby, both dressed in white pinafores. The baby had a little pink bow where there eventually at some point would be hair. The mother was smiling and the baby kept saying dada, dada every time someone walked down the aisle. The mother said daddy was waiting for them after they'd been gone a few days. She was so adorable, so quiet, all the passengers enjoyed watching this little child. Unfortunately, there was a lot of turbulence making the flight rough and bumpy and scary. That was rough on the baby. The mother had some fruit, a little thermos with orange juice in it. Every time that the baby would cry, the mother fed her a little bit more orange juice and a little bit more fruit. Seemed to look like a good idea at the time. But the turbulence seemed to spread from the air around the plane to right around the baby's gastrointestinal system. Pretty much all the fruit that came down came up. However, the process of coming up was a considerably messier than the process of going down. It also seemed to have increased in volume tremendously between going down and coming back up, so that not only were the baby and mother pretty much covered in it, but so were most of the passengers within a significant radius of the baby, including Jeanette George, the person who was telling the story. Fortunately, for the mortified mother, all the passengers were gracious and tried to help, help her and tell her it was okay. After all, what could she do about it? The baby was crying. She looked awful. Even though they didn't cry, their uh, fellow passengers looked and smelled pretty awful too. The mother was so sorry. As soon as they landed, the baby returned to Dada, Dada, looking around the corner. The rest of the passengers didn't quite recover so quickly. Mrs. George said, I had on a suit and I was trying to decide whether to burn it or just cut off the sleeve. It was pretty bad. Waiting for the plane was a young man who had to be Dada. He was wearing white slacks and a white shirt, carried white flowers. What do you think the clean daddy, all dressed in white, did when he saw a baby that was sticky and smelly, stuff all over her clothes, face, and what should be hair? He ran to the young mother who handed the baby over and Daddy picked up the baby and hugged her and kissed her and stroked her head. And as he held her close, he said, Daddy's baby's come home. Daddy's baby has come home. All the way to the luggage claim, he never stopped kissing the baby and welcoming her back. Mrs. George thought, where did I ever get the idea that my Father God is less loving than a young daddy in white slacks and white shirt and white flowers in his hand. Today, we're week three out of four in our series, White as Snow. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, you'll know that the title of our series comes from... Um, a passage 
Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Isaiah, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was speaking about the innumerable, innumerable sins of God's people. In fact, he said their transgressions were so numerous, they were weighed down by sin. Yet, even in the midst of that reality was the prophecy to say, it is possible to have your sins as white as snow. How could he say that? What was God's plan? These are good, good questions. We saw the first week that it is possible, even though your sins are like that garment that was stained with scarlet dye, every warp and woof affected, yet it was reasonable and possible to have that stain removed. We saw last week that the answer was Jesus, God who became man. God who took on the form of us sinful creatures in order to pay for our sin and make it reasonable and factual to say, you know what, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. The good news is, this is a perfect time of year to consider again, well, why would God need to be flesh and dwell among us? The Bible says, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Why did he come? Well, the Bible tells us why. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God not, has sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus didn't come to just hang out and have a fish fry or dinner parties. The plan was bigger. The plan was redemption of mankind. So this brings us to week three. First week, we saw that our sins could be whiter, whiter than snow. It's possible. We saw that God dwelt among us last week. This week, we're going to learn about our Redeemer. Now, Christ is not only God's great gift to us. He's not only the perfect high priest that we saw last week. He's not just God with us. Christ is our Redeemer. Now, we don't use that word a lot in English. What does it mean to be redeemed? Except for we can think of it in religious terms. But redeemer, redemption, the English words are derived from a Latin root that means to buy back. Hang with me here. One of the names for Christ is our redeemer. The, ones, the one who buys us back. The one who purchases freedom. So redemption, then, is purchased freedom. Think about that for a minute. Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, became man, lived a perfect life to be our redeemer, to purchase our freedom. It was by purchasing that freedom that allows the truth of the statement Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. 
because Jesus is our Redeemer. In the Greek, the root means to loose or to set free. The term is used of freeing from chains, slavery, or prison. In a theological context, then, the term redemption means being freed from the slavery and penalty and destiny of sin. This thought is indicated in the Gospels. We speak of Christ who came to give his life as a ransom. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many, a ransom, a purchased freedom, the Redeemer. Redemption also can lose some of its beauty and power if we just think of just buying stuff. Like a buy one, get one free, or a blue light special. But this is about purchasing freedom. This is about us being hopelessly enslaved to sin, enslaved to the penalty of sin, enslaved to the addiction of sin, Jesus coming and paying the price, which was his own life, to then hand us our emancipation papers. That is redemption. Wow. Now today, I want to take a few minutes and I want to consider the mission of the Christ child as the Redeemer. To purchase freedom. Freedom from what? Well, let's look at it. The first thing is, the redemption is purchased freedom from darkness and bondage. Take your Bible, please, and go to a prison epistle, uh, the book of Colossians, if you will. Colossians chapter 1 in the New Testament. Colossians chapter 1. And we'll be looking at verses 10 through 14. Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Giving thanks unto the Father which have made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We do right as those who have been set free not in order to merit freedom. We're free to live in the light empowered by his power, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear sons. Free to live with long suffering, free to live with joyfulness, in spite of our previous blinded 
the status as blinded slaves. We're free to be partakers in the inheritance of light. Look at, again, what a, what a great statement. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And if we're partakers of the saints in light, that means we've been freed from the power of darkness. Free from the condemnation and darkness of sin. When we were redeemed by the blood of Jesus, when we were bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus, we were bought and paid for and translated from the darkness that where we were blind, we couldn't see, we couldn't see how dirty and filthy we were, we couldn't see what sin actually was, we couldn't see our destination, we couldn't see any of that. And we were set free from that darkness and the light got turned on. Jesus came to the world. He was the light that lights the whole world. The light of the world is Jesus to set us free from the power of darkness. Light and dark are obviously an image of good and evil. And in the Bible, light is associated with God, with goodness, with hope, with positive things, and darkness, the opposite. But well, there's just not a convenient metaphor. Light and darkness have power for both good and evil. Uh, John Chittister says this. It's an interesting study. Psychologists tell us that one of the most difficult conditions a person can be forced to bear is guess what? It's not cold. It's light deprivation. Darkness, in fact, is used in military captivity or penal institutions to break down an individual's sense of self. Once a person becomes disoriented, they lose a sense of who they are and what it is that lurks in the dark around them or where the next crevasse or, or wall or attack may come from, once they can no longer feel in control of their physical surroundings, a person loses sense of self. Every shred of self-confidence shrivels. The giant within them falls and they become a whimpering prey of the unknown, the natural instinct to be combative, is paralyzed by fear. The spirit of resistance weakens and the prisoner becomes more pliable, more submissive, <coughs> more willing to take directions. It disarms a person. This falls into the sinkhole of sensory deprivation. It can drive them to madness. It is, every military knows, an effective technique. Nothing does more than darkness to isolate us from the sense of human support and an understanding which, whether we're commonly conscious of it or not, the human being's main source of self-definition. Indeed, darkness separates us from reality and disorients us and disorients a person physically and psychologically. Wow, think about that. And so the Bible says that we've been translated from darkness into the kingdom of light. The darkness that disoriented us, the darkness that weakened us, the darkness that paralyzed us. Darkness disorients a person, breaks them down, disarms them, swallows them whole. That doesn't sound very good, does it? Yet, you hear darkness described, there's something about it that makes sense. And it makes sense that the only antidote to darkness is what? There it is. And Jesus is that light. Man, that ought to get you right now. That the whole reason 
why Jesus came is to redeem us from the power and condemnation and blindness and fear and hopelessness that was our darkness. Paul writing to the church at Colossae where we just read this passage gives us this word about light and darkness and redemption. Those who abide in the kingdom of light have been freed from the dominion, the kingdom of darkness. That's why Paul can say with confidence that we've been translated into the power of the kingdom of light. There it is one more time. What's the answer? The answer is Jesus. Our Redeemer. Oswald Chambers said, Darkness is my point of view, the right to myself. And light is God's point of view. And he sees better than we do. Purchased from darkness, purchased freedom to experience the glory of God's grace. Now, we're in Colossians. I want you to uh, back up to Ephesians, please. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Purchased freedom to experience the glory of God's grace. See, here's the deal. When, when we think of the glory, let's think of the Christmas uh, account in, in Luke 2. When the angels busted up over the banisters of heaven into the sky uh, above the meadow outside of uh, Bethlehem where the shepherds were and scared the tar out of some shepherds. The glory of the Lord did what? Shone round about them. So glory equals what? Light. Think about that for a minute. When Jesus was transfigured and he saw his glory whiter than any fuller any bleacher could ever bleach. He's shining his glory. Glory is light. We've been translated, think about it, from the kingdom and the power and the, and, and the condemnation and the slavery of darkness into the kingdom of light. Now, the Bible's going to talk to us about being able to experience the glory or the light of God's grace. Now, you're in Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. What did he do? He made us accepted. We were in darkness. We were filthy. We were sinners. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Wow, why? Because my sins were replaced with God's righteousness. And we've learned, or with Christ's righteousness, and we learned that Christ's righteousness shone whiter than any snow. How is it that I could be whiter than snow when my sins were so dark? Because no longer is it my fabric, it's Christ's fabric that covers me. Made us accepted. Made us forgiven. Made us to continue to discover the depths of his riches, of his grace, every day. 
Look at verse 6 again. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Remember, grace, unmerited favor. The more we get to know God, the more we realize everything he does good for us is unmerited by us. The praise of the glory, the light, the beauty, the perfection of his grace. There it is again. Jesus, the one who through redemption comes, the one through whom the riches of grace flow from the Father, the one through which a river flows of lavish love. And the promises are made yea and amen through the glory of God. All the promises of God find their yes in Christ. What more can we do but muster up a, an amen when we respond to it? What more can we do but simply receive the extravagant love? Jonathan Edwards said, Grace is but glory begun, and glory is but grace perfected. Lastly, purchase freedom to walk in the light. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, meaning John wasn't the light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Jesus is the true light. Jesus is the glory. We beheld this glory full of grace and truth. First John chapter 1. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, we walk in, the, in darkness. We lie. We do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So in this life, our Redeemer has set us free from the kingdom of darkness and translated us into power of light. Okay, great. That's what we do right now. We come to church. We read the Bible. We see more light. We walk in the light. We, uh, we fellowship with children of the light. Man, that's good. But I want to tell you something. This sin-cursed world and just battling the darkness in this sin-cursed world is not the end of our redemption. God has something even greater in the kingdom of light. Go to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 22. Man, I love this. Are you there? Revelation 21 and verse 22. And I saw no, this is talking about the new heaven and new earth. I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine in it. For, now this is where we're going to be forever and ever. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Literally, the kingdom of light. The nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. The kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates 
of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Man. Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the ultimate Christmas light. Wow. The Redeemer. Purchased freedom. Purchased freedom from what? Purchase freedom from the slavery and the blindness and the condemnation of darkness. And purchase to walk in the light. And purchase to have our destiny one day in the kingdom of light where there is no other artificial lighting. It will be Jesus, our light. And the gates will never close at night because there will be no night. How cool is that? So what have we learned? We learned that our sins condemn us. Like that garment stained with scarlet. But Isaiah offered this prophecy that seemed unreasonable, yet he said, let's reason together, it is possible that though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. How? Through the God-man who came, God who came and took on the form of man, lived a perfect life, became our priest became our redeemer paid the price for our sin with his own blood and then once we trust in what he did sets us free from the power of darkness and translates us into the kingdom of light mm -hmm.